Hello, everyone, and good evening. Uh, I'm Chris Satulo, uh, Program Chair for the Sunday Breakfast Club, and I'd like to welcome you to this second of our two January bonus events on Zoom. <clears throat> Uh, tonight, as you can see on the screen, we're having a chat with Dave Boyer, who is the uh, a politics editor and reporter for the Washington Times newspaper. Uh, he's had a long career with them and with a couple other papers. I'll tell you about that in a minute. We're going to give uh, people a few more minutes to arrive, and then we'll get started. Okay, let's get started. Uh, again, welcome to the Sunday Breakfast Club's uh, second bonus digital event of January. Uh, on the screen, you see a picture of Air Force One, and the gentleman in the middle of the photo is probably familiar to all of you. Um, standing there uh, on the left side of the photo is our guest this evening, Dave Boyer, and we'll tell you a little bit more about him in a moment. Um, first of all, as always, we want to thank our sponsors. Um, and there you see the logos of our various sponsors. Without them and their generosity, the Sunday Breakfast Club would not be able to offer the programming and the food and the drink um, that you've grown accustomed to. So uh, we are gonna be returning to in-person on February 1st at the Fittler Club. And I'll talk a little bit more about that event about the Philadelphia mayor's race at the end of the program. But just a suggestion, if you uh, are at the February 1st event and see anyone who's a sponsor, you'll know that because their name tags have a little um, ribbon on them that lets you know they're a sponsor. Thank them for their support of the club and maybe ask them a question or two about their business and what they do. Um, it's important that we say thanks to these folks because they're absolutely essential to the success of the Sunday Breakfast Club. If we could go back to that opening slide a little bit. Again, that's Air Force One um, <clears throat> with President Obama in the middle of a press gaggle. And the man there on the, the left of the photo is Dave Boyer, our guest tonight. And he was just telling me before we came on that this was actually a photo of his first trip ever on Air Force One. I'd also like to mention uh, one other person who's in the photo on the right-hand side, uh, the gentleman with glasses who's smiling, is Jim Coonan, who was a longtime political reporter and White House correspondent for the Associated Press. Just a personal note about Jim and Dave. We share a bond. We all started out at the same small paper in the Lehigh Valley, the Eastern Express. Um, and Jim and Dave are two of a, of a total of six reporters who were at that paper in the early 80s who went on to become Washington correspondents. Um, the others were David Goldstein of Knight Ritter, who sadly died last week, uh, um, Tom Frank, who worked for Newsday and uh, USA Today, Michael Ramez, who worked for uh, Hartford Court and Times Mirror newspapers, and Marianne Lavelle, who worked for the National Law Journal. But now let's bring on our guest tonight, Dave Boyer, and I'll tell you just a little bit more about him, and then we'll get to talking about um, what's going on in Washington and what has gone on in Washington over the last few years. Welcome, Dave. Thanks, Chris. Hi. Thanks for having me. Sure. So uh, Dave uh, started out, as I mentioned, at the Express. He was a court reporter there and then went on to be the star Metro columnist, a very beloved writer in the Lehigh Valley. From there, he went to the Washington Times, where he covered the U.S. Congress for about four or five years and covered George Bush's run for the White House in 2000. Um, then uh, I played a hand in recruiting up to the Philadelphia Inquirer, where he stayed for about 10 years. He was an editorial writer and columnist there. Then he returned um, to the Washington Times to be a White House correspondent um, during the Obama administration. And then the Trump administration, he covered Obama's re-election campaign and Donald Trump's re-election campaign in 2016. Did I miss anything there, Dave? Nope, that sounds right. Okay, there we got it. So uh, let's start out uh, with some current events. There's been a lot going on in Washington. Uh, one of those things is the controversy over classified documents and the apparent tendency of our office holders to take some of those documents home with them afterwards, even though they shouldn't. Um, you were telling me recently about an occasion where you got a chance to see Donald Trump's handling of classified documents up close and personal in the White House. Yes, I was um, covering the White House for the Washington Times, and it was uh, right before the 2018 midterm elections, and Trump was giving interviews with just about everybody uh, who cared to go into the Oval Office, and so we had an interview set up with him, and he had stacks of papers on his desk in the oval and uh 
some of them were letters from Kim Jong-un, the North Korean dictator, and he offered to show us these letters, as he did with, as I heard later, many other journalists who would go in and out. Um, and it didn't occur to me at the time, but after this happened, I thought, you know, I'm certain those were classified documents. And uh, he was just kind of cavalier about the fact that he had them. He was proud of them. Um, he would often refer to the beautiful letters, almost like uh, love letters that they were writing to each other uh, with full of admiration for each other. And it was just something he was proud of. And it was pretty obvious from the way he talked about them that he considered them his, his personal property. And I, I think that's the real gist of the problem with Trump in this particular case is he just, he, he believed the presidency was sort of like him running the Trump organization and therefore all the paperwork that he wanted from that time in office, he was entitled to take with him, he felt. Yeah, and so now obviously President Biden has egg on his face after waxing indignant about um, Donald Trump's careless handling of classified materials. Um, he, we discover, has a number of them in, in an office and in his in Washington and in his house in Delaware. Um, just generally speaking, um, did you see a lot of looseness about classified material in the White House, or did these seem to be exceptions? To the no, I, I did not. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's the classified material is sort of a game, if you will, in Washington, in that, you know, you, you you sometimes get shared as a as a reporter with things that you shouldn't sources shouldn't be sharing with you and then it's you kind of have to the way you write the story you kind of have to protect yourself and sort of not reveal how you saw it or exactly what the nature of the material you saw was and i i know there's reporters who kind of write around those those details so they don't raise don't, don't you know bring an investigation on themselves. Um, but I did not uh, see a lot of that, um, you know, people being willing to share top secret information, you know, you, you would, um, you know, the CIA uh, is obviously a very tough nut to crack and you would, they have a press office that you can call and try to get them to either wave you off a story or sort of give you an idea that you're on the right track. But um uh, no, generally not. Yeah, you know, there is uh, opinion in some quarters that uh, the Washington press corps was, quote, in the tank for Barack Obama for much of his administration. But actually, there was some pretty testy relationship between the, the press corps and Obama around this issue of classified, right? He went pretty hard after some reporters who had reported things. That yes, were... yes. He, had, he, he generated a lot of ill will with the press corps over... Uh, Justice Department investigations. I remember, I think Associated Press was a target of one. And um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a tense time there for a while in that regard. And, um, you know, I, I kind of, I keep coming back to Trump and I kind of just, he's just in, in, in a different category in so many different ways um, that um, uh, his handling of that, I think, is even though Biden did, does have this problem now on his hands with the classified documents, it, it's it's more of an optics problem, I think, for Biden at this point than it is a serious threat of an of a criminal charge being brought against Biden. Whereas with Trump, up until this happened with Biden, I would have said, yes, Trump was in a, a very, very serious predicament with possible criminal charges coming now mainly because of the way it looks politically. I think uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland is going to have a, a much tougher time bringing criminal charges um, if that's still in the offing and, and just how it would look politically uh, with his own boss in, in kind of the same situation. Yeah, so we mentioned you, you covered the Congress in the late 90s and the late part of the 2000s. Um, was it a very different Congress then? And how do you see things being different now? I know you don't cover it day to day anymore, but. So no, but I think, yeah, it was, it was different. Um, it, it just, it just continues to get more hyper-partisan every year that goes by. Um, I mean, 
the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world just didn't used to get as much attention as they do now. And there are there are Democrats on on the other side who are, you know, pretty much in the same. They're bomb throwers, you know, and and uh, so the there's this it's just it's just they keep the parties just keep driving each other away further and further. There's nobody left in the middle. Like there when I was there around the late 90s, there was a sizable group of centrists, you know, we I don't even know if anybody uses the word centrist anymore, except to maybe for Joe Manchin of West Virginia. Um, and they could, I would say at the time, there were probably 40 or 50 of them in both parties, who you could once in a while count on to build a coalition around a particular issue. And that just really doesn't happen anymore. It's like your old elementary school classmate, Charlie Dent, was one of those people who had some leverage, right? Because they he were did. on the other side. Every once he did. Time. Charlie was one of those rare, becoming rarer um, pro-choice Republicans uh, from the Lehigh Valley. And um, yes, we went to first grade together. And um, yeah, he, he just, you know, during the Trump era, he just uh, got increasingly isolated in his own party. And then he, the Democrats didn't really want to work with him all that much because they were, you know, facing primary voters who didn't want them. They didn't want to invite challenges in a primary uh, for working with Republicans. So where does a person like Charlie go? Well, he went to CNN. Uh, you were mentioning before we came on, um, it's not mm -hmm. schoolhouse rock Congress anymore. Um, how no, no, I, you know, what we learned in grade school about how a bill becomes law, you know, it goes through committee markups and, and, you know, there's a vote in the, in the committee of jurisdiction and then, it, and then it gets brought to the floor if they allow it to become a, a come up for a, a full house vote. And, and that just doesn't happen much anymore. Nowadays it's, you know, these, these huge free for all bills that they pass right before this the deadline to shut down the government, uh, you know, usually before Christmas, and uh, that's what happened again this year. And and uh, they pass a 1.7 trillion dollar package that covers every all 13 federal agencies, and it basically just increases spending, you know, so and so percent over the previous year's spending. And the the lawmakers don't really know what's in the bill because it's sprung on them you know with two or three days before the vote and um that that's part of what was i believe driving this uh revolt against kevin mccarthy becoming speaker uh, from the republican side there were there's quite a few republicans you know in the rank and file and there are there are democrats who feel the same way that they're not included in the debates over these big issues on spending and and what have you and then uh their voice doesn't really matter but then when the vote time comes for a final vote the leadership on both parties expects them to fall into line and either vote yes or no depending on which way that it's going whether it's for the administration or against and um you know you saw the result with kevin mccarthy the other week when he had what was it 15 15 ballots before he finally was elected and you had to give away lots of concessions to get there right well you know i don't imagine i'm just guessing there aren't a ton of fans of matt gates on this uh zoom tonight um myra club club members but he has a point right he has a point that um you know, we now we now have this form of legislation where you know there's really not much voice for almost all the rank and file, um, and there's not the usual debate in subcommittees often that they used to have, right? He does. I mean, and and he's certainly one of my least favorite House members, um, but yeah, I mean, he stuck to his guns and he got some of what he wanted, and um, now. Uh, not to use the cliche, but the proof is in the pudding. We'll see how this all shakes out when they actually try to legislate things. Um, you know, we're going to have this really ugly fight about the debt ceiling, raising the borrowing authority uh, in the next couple of months. And uh, um, 
my my fear, you know, my guess is it's just going to after the McCarthy was elected speaker, it's all downhill from there. Right. Um, just want to remind everybody, if you have any questions for Dave, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll work them into the conversation as we go along. Now, you were White House correspondent um, for quite a while, and the phrase White House correspondent almost drips with glamour and, um, in some senses. But tell us a little bit more about what the daily life of White House correspondent was like. What was good about it and what was not so good? Well, I'll start with the not so good. Um, your access to key people in the administration, uh, you know, from the president on down is extremely limited. Um, I came to the White House having covered Congress, um, where if you waited around in a hallway long enough, you would run into John McCain or somebody else who was good for a quote, uh, or, you know, would tell you what you needed to know. Um, the White House is not like that at all. You're, you're restricted basically to the the press briefing room that you you can all see on TV and you know you can walk down the hallway to the press secretary's office which is very nice I mean they have their own fireplace and it's a big nice comfy office uh, usually they don't let you wait in the office you have to wait in the hallway outside until you try to grab them but um and those are really the only two places you can be I had a desk in the White House in a hallway that was about as wide as my laptop and you know, had a broken chair, and that was uh, that was pretty much a luxurious accommodation for the White House. Uh, the uh, television networks and the radio networks have their own booths with closed doors, but those are extremely cramped, and they get three or four people working in those. And uh, um, so it really was not a good place to sit and try to compose a story, you know, <laughs> on your laptop. It was uh, very noisy, very cramped. And um, you often couldn't reach the people you were trying to reach. So that's the downside. Um, the great stuff was, you know, uh, like you meant you showed the picture of Air Force One. I got to fly on Air Force One probably 50 or 60 times over the years. I was there for 10 years. Um, um, we had the Washington Times is in a um, what they call a pool duty rotation. The, the way the, the way that news organizations cover the White House is that there's 30 or 35 news organizations, including us, that join a pool, a, a group that is assigned on a rotating basis, once usually once a month, well, it's once every 35 days or whatever the number is, to be in a, a much smaller group to represent the entire press corps to cover the president like when he has a one-on-one -on -one with a foreign leader in the Oval Office or when he has a cabinet meeting or because they can't have 30 reporters uh, or, or 100 reporters in the Oval Office uh, trying to hear what the president is saying. So my job on those occasions was to, you know, take notes of what, what Obama or Trump was saying and um, relay them quickly and briefly to the rest of the journalism world in an email uh, pool report. And the TV networks and the radio, they do the same thing. They all share this information that we're all, you know, so there'll be like maybe 10 of us in the room with the president. And uh, the same thing happens when you do a trip on Air Force One. The, the press cabin on Air Force One is, I think, 14 seats. So and that includes TV cameramen, TV sound people, producers, um, two print journalists, you know, one magazine journalist, uh, I think, I think two wire service reporters, and uh, that's the group. And so uh, when your turn comes around on travel pool, you get to go with the president on the plane wherever he's going. And then the, your organization pays a prorated share of the mileage uh for the flights and everything and the food but you know you get to see you get to fly on air force one and and sometimes as you showed in that picture obama would obama almost never came back to the press co uh, cabin to talk to us that's what's really rare about that picture you showed um uh he just happened to pop in and that just happened to be my very first flight on the plane so that was really cool so you were saying that was the your first flight the plane and it was also the first flight for a refurbished air force one is that right no that was actually a different time but um 
there, there was another trip uh, during the 2012 campaign when Obama was um, going to a fundraiser at the home of Harvey Weinstein. You all remember him, the movie producer um, in Connecticut. He had a fabulous house on the water on Long Island Sound in Connecticut. And he, he was, um, he had an intimate dinner for 30 people from Hollywood, including um, Anna Wintour. I mean, not Hollywood, but um, Anne Hathaway and and uh, Aaron Sorkin and people like that. And so, you know, there's little old me from Allentown, Pennsylvania in this room with all these, you know, Hollywood luminaries and standing up against a wall in a, in this fabulous dining room that he owned, uh, listening to the president kind of flirt with Anne Hathaway. And anyway, the the story about the plane was that on that trip, as we were, we were getting ready to take off from Andrews Air Force Base, the uh, the Air Force wing that maintained and controlled the plane had just finished a refurbishing of the plane. And basically they took the, the old frame and completely redid the inside and they put new wiring in with all the all the different equipment and, and new seats and new carpeting. So we were getting ready to take off finally from Air Force, uh, from Andrews, and they had these little bagged uh, dinners on our seat. And the guy from the Washington Post who was sitting next to me, like tore into his bag to start eating before we took off. And I, it was a Cobb salad in a, in a plastic container. And he poured dressing from a little foil pouch all over the salad. And I said to him, you know, you're not going to have time to eat that because once we get in the air, the press secretary is going to start the little gaggle that he does. It's like a mini press conference on board the plane. And I said, and, you know, this this flight's only like 45 minutes long. You know, we'll, we'll be there by the time you try to eat it. And he said, yeah, you're right. So he started to put the lid back on the Cobb salad and his hands were greasy and he dropped the salad on the carpet in this brand new plane. And I, th this, this oily stain just started spreading in the middle of the aisle in this, in this, on this carpet. And uh, I had to put that in the pool report just, just to make him uncomfortable to kind of poke fun at him. He was deeply appreciative of that. Yeah. So talk a little bit about uh, the White House press briefing um, with the press secretaries and the rare occasions when the president comes in. I recall when John Stewart was on The Daily Show, he was always like, why aren't you guys tougher? Why don't you bring them to their knees? Why don't yeah. you yes, it's so easy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> talk a little bit about how what that setup's like and what it's like to try to wedge your way in and ask a question. Uh it's it's kind of a pain, you know. It, it's 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 sort of performance art. I think everybody looks at it that way a little bit. Yet it still is the one of the few ways that you can try to hold the administration to account on any given thing. So, um, you know, you just have to go along and play the game the the way it's set up, and um, uh, it depends on your rapport to some extent with the with the press secretary, whoever the press secretary happens to be that year. Um, when I started there, it was Jay Carney and he and I didn't get along at all. He didn't like our outlet. And um, so, you know, I could sit there in the fourth row with my, I said to you the with my arm up in the air, like Arnold Horshack on the old welcome back Cotter saying, ooh, ooh, call on me. And he just never would. And, um, and then he, Obama's second press se secretary was Josh Ernest, who was, I think just a, more fair person in general and he he didn't ignore the conservative news outlets the way it had happened in the past and so we got along better and then under trump sean spicer and i you know i just i i like sean personally i didn't think he was really cut out for the job very well and i think he unfortunately made that clear on his very first day on the job when you know, Trump was unhappy with the coverage of his inaugural crowd and, you know, the supposed millions who were on the on the lawn and the National Mall. And, you know, the pictures made clear there were not that many compared with Obama's inaug first inauguration. And but he sent Sean out into the press briefing room to basically yell at all of us and, you know, kind of chastise us for misreporting the crowd size. And 
you know, that was his very first day as White House press secretary, and he never really recovered his um, credibility after that. So um, I felt bad for him in that way. And then Sarah Sanders followed him, uh, now governor of Arkansas. And I, I I liked her. I thought she was very smart and, and fair. And, uh, you know, she had to obviously promote the president. And that's, that's her job, too. Uh, and so I know a lot of people took issue with her for that. And then after her, it was just kind of downhill with uh, us. I think there were at least two or three others after her, some of whom never even bothered to have press briefings. And and then COVID came along and that just kind of changed everything at the end there when I worked there. So, yeah. So you more or less, you know, your last part of covering the Trump White House was from home, right? Because Right, yeah. right. There, there was a there was a lottery system that the press association, the White House Correspondents Association, developed for assigning seats that were spaced out, you know, uh, theoretically enough so that nobody would catch COVID from each other and we could still do briefings. But basically, that meant that there were four times fewer seats than we used to have, and so it was on a very limited rotating basis and. Um, and then you were dealing with one of those last two press secretaries who were, in my view, pretty much worthless as far as trying to get any information out of anyway. So the the equation, the kind of the consideration was, do you go to the White House for a kind of pointless show where you might catch a deadly disease? You know, and I, I just decided I was more productive and safer at home. And I that's what I ended up doing for the most part. Right. So let me let me ask a delicate question that might be on the minds of some people uh, who are with us tonight. You work for the Washington Times, which as uh, an editorial board has an extremely conservative posture, and the paper basically views the news through you know a somewhat conservative lens. Um, having known you for a long time, I know that the politics of the Washington Times editorial board are not exactly your politics. So how have you navigated that sort of potential tension over the years? Well, I, I would say in the beginning, it wasn't all that difficult. I felt like, uh, especially on the Hill, I felt like um, breaking news is breaking news. You know, if, if, there's a, if there's a vote to approve a Supreme Court justice or to pass a bill or something, that's pretty much a fact and you know you you just it's a matter of getting it out fast and you're kind of insulated from ideology to an extent by just reporting the news um but with as social media has gotten more and more important um over the last i don't know 10 years um it you know i think partisan pressure on both sides is just a lot greater now on news organizations in general and not just us uh, I, I count liberal groups in that equation too um so it's definitely more difficult now to not get accused of um taking sides but i've still just tried to not ignore it, if you will, but just kind of not worry about it too much. I don't know. What about from on high, the edit editors at the Washington Times? Have you ever felt ordered to do something you didn't want to do? Do you ever feel your copy got chewed up? Uh, no, no. Um, uh, you know, I've had editors at at many different places who, you know, the nightmare scenario is an editor to me who, you know, has... 40 ideas before he gets out of the shower in the morning. And by the time you get out of bed and you, you know, you, you've got five emails from them and it, it just, you know, kind of ruins your day. But um, I've worked with people like that and that's not really coming from a partisan bent. It's just a, kind of a hair on fire sort of thing. And um, I, that bothers me more than uh, it just, I would just rather they just let me go find a story, you know, and so that's mostly been the, the, the way I work um, for my whole career, which is, I hate to say like 40 years now, but um, so I, no, nobody has ever 
ordered me or told me like you must have this angle or you must cover it this way you know we know who our readers are at the washington times we know they want the conservative viewpoint represented it was really tough uh at the end of the trump administration because obviously quite a lot of our readers were pro-trump but then there was this significant I, I can't quantify it but um significant chunk of people readers who didn't like trump and so that, that was that was okay you know it made me feel like you know just report the news and let the chips fall where they will but so just speaking generally uh, of the washington press corps you know particularly sort of the uh some of the marquee papers like the times and the post um it seems reading them that uh the trump administration was a challenge to their old way of doing business and they got a lot of pressure from their readers and from liberal social media to be way more blunt and critical and to use the word lie and you know not use the word misinformation have you noticed that have you talked to your colleagues it's it's some of those papers uh are the gloves a little bit off at those papers? I think I see things on the front pages there that you never would have seen 10 years ago. Yeah, I think so too. I have not, you know, cornered anybody about that in another news organization, but I just, um, I've noticed it at even watching CNN, you know, I mean, Jake Tapper, I, I, I know he's from Philadelphia. I like him a lot. I respect him, but he, I think has another per another his whole network i think has has taken that approach um you know to, to just be a lot more blunt and to um i don't want to say they don't give them the benefit of the doubt but they're it's it's almost like they have to um say trump is lying for example or you know that that that's part of their their message now and um i don't know where that's going to fall with i mean with biden it's more like i think the the criticism from the right is more that he's incompetent you know or bumbling than than um dishonest uh but i think there's uh there's a mindset among readers of our paper and other conservative outlets that you know biden um is just a senile b bumbling you know those those kind of things and and um it's 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 just a very difficult um path to navigate when you know for biden will contribute to that to perception a lot so even though i think he's he obviously he knows what he's doing he's to me he is um after two years, I've decided I really chronically underestimate what Biden can do because he's an he's an old political Washington hand, and you got to give him credit for knowing his way around Congress and and the White House. So yeah, listening as you talk, it, it, the thoughts are forming in my head. Uh, narratives form; they're sort of amplified and spread. Um, you know, in the partisan social media, and it's like a narrative, you know, Trump's a liar, um, Uncle Joe is senile. Um, do you feel like you're just, that you have to take certain steps to challenge those narratives when they seem to be contravening the facts or what you actually see going on? Well, I mean, challenging that you, you can really go down a lot of rabbit holes doing that. I think you just have to, you just have to focus on who said what, you know, who found what in what closet or, you know, and just stick to the facts as much as you can. And um, if if Biden had his eyes closed in a meeting for 30 seconds and his chin hit his his uh, chest, well, you just report it that way, you know, and uh, um, but. Um, you know, I'm thinking back to to the end of the Trump term too when people wanted him removed by the 25th amendment including some people in his administration because they thought he was you know out of control dangerous and 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 not lucid anymore and in, in his anger at losing the election and um um we just 
it's we just didn't get far enough into that because the term ended thank god but um i don't i don't think the narrative you can't you can't get all uh controlled by the narrative that's out there and people are going to think what they want right you covered uh three presidential campaigns uh bush in 2000 obama in 2012 and then uh, trump when he ran for re-election can you tell folks a little bit what the life of some you know one of the boys on the bus is you know uh again yeah. what are the good things and what are the challenging things yeah the the good things is or you know especially when you're dealing with a candidate who's not currently president you tend to get a lot more access to that person like george w bush um so, you know, I was on his campaign plane for probably four or five months, and um, it was fun. Uh, you got to see a lot. You got to get to know the staff who were going to be presumably working in the White House if he won. Um, you got, uh, there was just, there was just a good camaraderie around, among the press corps for the most part. You know, everybody knows that you're, cell phone batteries die and you know your laptop stop working for whatever reason and they're they're you know all too willing to help out you help you out even if you're a competitor um and i just i think back to it it, it kind of ages me but i think back to the, all the technology issues that i would deal with over those years and i remember um when i when i first started covering the bush campaign i was working off of a very heavy radio shack laptop it weighed like eight or nine pounds it was a real pain in the butt to carry around on the road with you and um we didn't have uh we didn't have wi-fi that campaign until very near the end and um so every day after the candidate gave a speech somewhere they would take us in the press bus to a hotel nearby so we could all plug into landlines so we could write up a quick story and send it. Um, that's the way things were done for a long time on campaigns. And then um, I had somebody told me uh, about a way I could hook up. I could buy a cable at Radio Shack, hook it up to my cell phone, plug it into my laptop, and theoretically transmit a story from anywhere I, I wanted to be. And so I remember we were. It was sometime like a month before election day and we were on a bus going down a highway in the rain in Missouri and I had this, you know, all set up to send and I tried it from the bus going 60 miles an hour and it looked on the phone screen like it actually worked and so but it drained like half of my phone battery just to send one story and so when I when I got off the, when I cut the transmission, I called my editor back in Washington and I said, you know, Joe, I sent the story, did you get it? And he said, yeah, it's here. And I said, Joe, and it was like, it was like angels were singing and the clouds had parted. And I, he said, what? And I said, I'm on a bus. And I, I and there was like a five second pause and he said, oh my God, you know? And it was just like, this new era had dawned, you know, and caveman um, discovering fire now. Yes, exactly. Uh, speaking of buses, that's one of the big rookie mistakes for a correspondent, right? Missing the bus. Oh my God! Yes, my yeah, that was that's that was also with Bush. On my very first day uh, traveling with him, he had gone to. Um, he was trying to establish his bona fides with um, Christian conservative evangelical voters before the South Carolina Republican primary. And he went to a place called Bob Jones University, which is an evangelical school. And, um, you know, he just gave a speech and I was very worried about, you know, everybody drills it into you on the campaign. Don't, don't leave the bubble, which means don't leave the bus or the press bus. Don't get left behind basically, uh, because it's very difficult to get back into the bubble once you've gotten left behind. So after the speech, I came out to the sidewalk and the press bus was idling there. And I was so conscious about not getting left behind that I actually put my back up against the side of the bus so I wouldn't miss it leaving. And there was a couple of uh, faculty members from the university there. And I was asking them what they thought of Bush's speech. And I was taking notes. 
And all of a sudden I was aware that the, the bus engines were revving <clears throat> and I turned around and the bus had pulled away from the curb. And this was my very first event. And I was, I had gotten left behind and I, I looked at these two faculty members from this conservative Christian university and I screamed, Jesus Christ. And then I just, I left them in mid sentence. I took off running down the road after the bus. And fortunately the bus had to stop at a, at a red light a couple blocks away. And I, I managed to get back on board and sweating and looking embarrassed and as a rookie reporter in front of all these grizzled veterans. Uh, so you covered um, three presidents as they were running for the presidency, which is sort of a pressure cooker that reveals things. And you've sort of, you know, covered the Biden administration from a distance doing some reporting and editing. Um, can you give folks any, any bit of a sense of what they're like when the lights are on, when they're just you know, hanging out or under pressure or letting their hair down a little bit. Yeah. The, I mean, my poor wife has heard this story a million times, but I, I, I generally liked Bush. Um, I just felt like he was, he would be easy to talk to in, you know, a casual setting. Um, uh, I, he visited Allentown, Pennsylvania, where I grew up and where my parents uh, lived. Um, on Labor Day weekend of that year in 2000. And I, I called my parents before we got there. And I said, if you want to meet Governor Bush, I said, show up at this certain hotel at nine o'clock tonight. And um, that's where he's, that's when he's checking in. Um, Secret Service probably wouldn't have been happy that I did that, but it was my parents. So I, we got into Allentown on the plane. I was on the press bus. He got in his SUV and went to the hotel. And he got out of the car at like nine o'clock on a Sunday night in Allentown, Pennsylvania. It's not the most happening place in the world. And he was looking for hands to shake. And he ran over to these two people. And it was my mom and dad. And they were the only ones there on the sidewalk. And he said, hi, I'm Governor Bush. I'm asking for your vote. And my mom said, we know we're Dave Boyer's parents. And they were thrilled to meet him. He was very nice to them. And um, But I never that was September, early September. And I just didn't get a chance to talk to him about it until the very last night of the, the campaign before election day. And we were flying back to Texas because uh, he was still governor of Texas. And I, he came through the press cabin and he was shaking hands with everybody saying, nice to know you. Thanks for covering my campaign. And he got to me and he said, it's been a real pleasure working with you. And I wanted you to be sure to tell your folks how much I enjoyed meeting them. So, you know, it was a nice, it was a nice gesture. Um, Obama, I had rare interactions with um, in, in off the record settings. I felt like he was he was, you know, first of all, he's a Democrat. My paper is conservative. He didn't like, they didn't like our coverage. And, you know, my paper's editorial board, you know, hated him. So um, there was that tension going on, but he was, he was cordial. And um, he, uh, even though this event was off the record, it was like a little cocktail party they had set up for us on the road. Um, he, he um, was, I was with a group of three other journalists and he was basically thanking us for, leaving his daughters out of it you know he's basically he had been in office for three going on four years and he was he said he was pleased with the fact that you know his daughters the media treated his daughters like they were off limits they were young going to school in washington and and he was he said you know they were basically able to live as much as a normal life as you can and when you're the child of a president you know in that fishbowl but um and then trump was, you know, um, obviously so uh, focused on himself and so needing of attention constantly. It just, um, personally, I got tired of the drama every day that was sort of, you know, a lot of times it was just meaningless drama, but it was still there and you had to deal with it. And um, one one very strange might have been the same time we interviewed him and he had the stack of the letters from Kim Jong-un on the desk, but he had, I was trying to um, get something out, out of him about the upcoming midterm elections that nobody else had gotten out of him. And that was hard to do because he, he talks to the reporters constantly and, and all the time. And um, 
But the day that we were interviewing him, um, Oprah Winfrey was going to Georgia to campaign for Stacey Abrams, I believe, who uh, was running for, I guess, governor that year. And I knew that he had had a relationship with Oprah over the years, you know, professionally. And I, I thought, well, maybe he'll have something to say. Maybe this will tick him off that Oprah is, you know, doing this for a Democrat. And um, so when we got into the Oval Office and we started the interview, I said, you know, Mr. President, o Oprah, you saw is going to campaign in Georgia for Stacey Abrams. Um, you're obviously against Stacey Abrams. You know, what's your reaction? And instead of saying, you know, like I, I, she shouldn't do something either yes, no, or maybe, he looked at me and he said, you know, Oprah and I were really, we're really good friends. And I said, I, I know uh, you, you were on the sh her show a lot, right? And, and then he asked Sarah Sanders to bring in some pictures that he had, and he, so that took a while. And then he, he she put the, a stack of mimeograph pictures of him and Oprah. There were like twenty or thirty of them on the yeah. desk in the Oval Office, and he handed them to me. And, uh, you know, they were just Xerox copies of pictures, old pictures of him and Oprah together. And I looked at like five of them out of the stack and I thought, you know, time's wasting here. We got we to gotta get something out of them for our story. And I put the stack back down in front of him and he got really offended and he said, no, look at them all. <laughs> I'm just like, I've just, it just felt so weird. I didn't know what his point was, you know, but. Um, Sometimes you could have a, a reasonable chat with him, and other times he was just kind of hard to understand. Okay, again, reminding people, if you want to ask, uh, have Dave answer a question, put it in the chat. Um, Dave, some guy named Jim Coonan has put a question in the chat. Um, oh, my gosh. Kind of a plan. Scoundrel. Yeah, but um, he's uh, noting that um, a lot of the personnel in the Biden White House is carry over or, you know, worked for Obama at some point. And he's wondering, um, given that there are a lot of the same people, is there a different vibe, a different relationship with the press that you you can note between the two administrations? I, I think, I think, yeah, I do think there's a different vibe. I, I think uh, particularly with uh, the new press secretary, Corrine, um, she's, she's just, I, I don't like the job she's doing and she's just not very good on, on, in dealing with unexpected questions. I, I don't, she, she falls back way too often on the talking points that they give her, even when they don't really fit the situation or fit the question or, or make sense. And, um, I don't understand that, but, um, I'm sure she's doing the best she can. It's just not very good at the moment. Um, and I thought um, Jen Psaki, who had worked for Obama, at least during his 2012 campaign, I'm not sure if she ever worked for his White House or not, but um, she was Biden's first secretary. And she was she was much more of a carryover from the Obama years when, you know, she she was really good on her feet. She dealt with people professionally, but she didn't take any any crap. And she was um, just really good. Um, as far as the senior staff, I don't know. I don't know Ron Klain, the chief of staff. Um, and I feel like the Biden people are a little less controlled than the Trump, than the Obama people were in, in, in granting access to him and, uh, and just answering questions in general. I think it's, I just think their their press operation and their message operation under Biden is not as disciplined as it was under under Obama. Uh, going back to Jen Psaki for a moment, uh, perhaps I'm just naive and completely out of touch with the way the world works, but I was stunned that she left so soon and then marched right it over to MSNBC. Was that a shock or was that just... No, you know, no, that didn't surprise me at all. That's, okay. you know make hay while the sun shines yeah but it was really quick wasn't it i mean it was like 18 months or yeah it sort of felt like there must have been discussions going on before she left the white house but yeah. um it it doesn't surprise me i mean uh 
I think that's kind of accepted now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, you've been doing this for 40 years. How much longer do you think you're going to, you've got left in you? Or is, uh... At least 15 minutes. I don't know. <laughs> least um, so what are you doing now? You're doing sort of a mix of writing and editing? Yes. I'm, I would say I'm 75% editing and 25% writing. Um, I never go to the White House anymore. That's we have two two other people covering it full time. Um, I still I still cover the White House when uh, when I'm needed to, but um, I I kind of do bigger picture stories and and a, a lot I do a lot of economic reporting nowadays, especially um, with you know are we in a recession or aren't we and what's how, how's inflation going to ever come down and that kind of thing. And, um, so I'm I'm enjoying it. Um, it's definitely um, different. It's you, you when you're an editor, as you know, you wait for the the work to come to you a lot of the times, and you're kind of at the mercy of people filing stories. But overall, it's it's good. I don't know, Matt, probably three four years yet. Mm -hmm. So Washington Times readers, uh, I don't know how much interaction you have with them. I don't know if you ever read the comments under your stories, but. How would you describe the Washington Times reader? Uh, over the years, you know, I think it varies from from administration to administration about how exercised people get. But I think in general, they're pro-life. They're um, they would call themselves fiscal conservatives. Um, they're you know, their government spends too much money. Government taxes too much, uh, although. When there's a Republican in office like Trump who spent money, you know, as as highly as anybody else, uh, th those criticisms you don't see as often. So, um, those are the those are the main things. I think there's there's concern in general or interest in general in uh, a lot of LBGTQ issues, um, a lot of transgender. Um, you know, like the same sex bathroom stuff in the North Carolina schools, those kind of stories or, or, or wherever the school district is, those those are always getting a lot of attention uh, from our readers. Um, they're, they're generally conservative, but they're not always interested in the same conservative. Some of them are social conservative issues or religious conservative issues and some are just just plain fiscal. Right. Now, uh, I'm not sure how much you saw this uh, when you were covering Trump in 2020, but uh, obviously, if you're a member of an organization, an outlet that's regarded as part of the liberal media, you know, the fake news, it got a little uh, intimidating, a, a little scary sometimes for those reporters at Trump rallies. Did you witness that at all? And did you ever have anything directed at you, either accidentally? Yeah. Because it's something you wrote. Yeah, the, I think the scariest um, night of my life as a reporter was right after the. It was shortly after the Charlottesville um, incident in 2017, where the you know they had the white nationalists protesting over those Confederate statues, and then the the progressive protester got killed by a, somebody driving one of those cars into a crowd and. Um, so anyway, it was after all that, and then Trump got very defensive about, you know, saying there were fine people on both sides. And um, I would say like the following week, I was on a pool duty trip with Trump to Phoenix, and um, it was in a big convention center, just a huge, you know, ballroom with 7,000 people in it. And they put the press pen right in the center of the room with just basically like bicycle racks around us. And they had some desks set up and then the camera risers. And, and um, you know, of course, somebody like Jim Acosta for CNN, who's recognizable, is always going to get crap and, you know, directed at him in a, in a Trump crowd and probably some threats too. But I had not really been on the on the receiving end of any of that until this happened and um so uh as soon as we got there you know even before trump came out on stage the crowd you know obviously they know where the media they're 
making snide comments. They're giving us the finger and that kind of thing. And um, then Trump came out and shortly after he started his speech, of course he started talking about the whole Charlottesville thing and how unfair the media had treated them. And he did his thing where he pointed at the cameras and said, see, they're turning their red lights off now. They don't want to report what I'm saying. And that, that gets the crowd going against us a little more. And um, and then at one point he said, um, he was talking about you know the media persecuting him and being so unfair to him in this particular case. And he said, uh, I'll never forget it. He said, it's not when they... Uh, attack me the media attacks me that gets me upset it's when they attack you meaning the crowd his supporters and as soon as he said that you just felt the level of anger in the room just swell up immediately and they all it felt like there were you know seven thousand pairs of eyes you know directed right at us which is what he wanted and um they were you know the the people started approaching the bicycle racks and, you know, jabbing their fingers at us and, you know, cursing at us. And I really felt like, uh, I said to the, one of the guys later from the press corps, I said, you know, that when we were back in the safety of our hotel bar, I said, um, I felt like at that moment, if Trump had pointed at us and said, there they are, go get them, they would have all come over and just beaten the crap out of us. I really, I really did feel that way. And he, I felt like, he knew he had that power and he wanted us to know he had that power. Um, and it was, it was, a, it was intimidating, you know? Yeah. Uh, we did get one question um, from Steve McCarter and he asked, Dave, what are the key points we need to watch in this upcoming battle over the debt ceiling and how do you see it playing out? Oh gosh. Um, yeah, it's really important. And uh, you know, I think you got to watch for, which side blinks first, you know, that we know what their positions are. The White House's position is they're not going to negotiate at all. You raise, you, Congress will raise the debt ceiling or, and that's our final offer. Um, so on the other hand, McCarthy and his troops in the House um, want to at least sit down and talk to the White House about cutting spending uh, back to 2022 levels, which would be you know, close to, I think, a 10% uh, cut in spending, which uh, you're not going to get that House with that narrow Republican majority to go for, and then it would be dead in the Senate anyway. So my, my uh, under the normal circumstances, I would say the Republicans will end up retreating, and uh, the White House would win this battle. But with, with this particular uh, dynamic with McCarthy having like only four or five votes to play with and this uh, crowd of far right Republicans in the house, you know, feeling more empowered um, to, to satisfy their voters and get what they want. Um, I really don't have a feel at this point, mm -hmm. except that I, it'll probably go up until the last possible minute in early June or, or whenever the they were scheduled to run out of money. Okay, uh, I, I was going to wrap it up, but I know some people just joined from the waiting room, so I feel bad that they're only getting a couple of minutes. So I think I'll just ask, if there's anyone in the audience who wants to ask a question um, directly, just unmute yourself and jump in and we'll take a few more questions if anybody has them. An unusually shy group here tonight, Dave. I'm so intimidating. Uh, well, Dave, I want to thank you for uh, sharing some time and some of your wisdom and some of your stories about life on the campaign trail and in the White House with us. With us, we appreciate it very much. Sure, thanks a lot, Chris. Okay, quickly uh, before we wrap up, and I apologize to those folks who just came in because you're not getting too much content tonight, but. Um, want to remind you that we will be back in person on February 1st at the Fittler Club, and our topic will be advice for Philly's next mayor. We'll be reviewing what the issues are, what the hopes are for the city government that we'll be electing this year. We're going to have an interactive session. We'll have a group of five or six people who've been working hard at ground level 
on the key issues in the city, on education, on neighborhood quality of life, on the economy and jobs, on environmental sustainability, um, on public safety. Um, and they will give you a five minute version. If they had five minutes with the next mayor, what they would tell him or her. Uh, and then we'll go to the tables. We'll have uh, discussion sessions at the tables led by members of our um, steering committee, our club board. And we'll ask you, what would your advice for the mayor be? And you can discuss it a bit at your table and generate some observations and questions to bring back to our panelists for the final segment. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, I know at one point we had talked about having the mayoral candidates in for an event. Uh, I'm sorry to report to you, but it was kind of unavoidable. With the number of candidates there are now and the number of events that had already been planned, it just became impossible to schedule enough of the candidates to have a representative sampling and not to be unfair to others. And even some of the partners we uh, had lined up who planned to work with us were saying they were under pressure uh, not to be involved in so many events because the calendar was getting so clogged. So we decided to call an audible and go with this idea, which we hope will be an interesting um, and stimulating interactive session. So that's on February 1st. Uh, we'll send you out uh, another notice about it early next week with the sign up if you haven't signed up so far. But we do have a lot of people signed up, so it should be a lively session. That'll be back at the Fittler Club on Wednesday, February 1st. Again, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank you to Dave Boyer uh, for being with us. And uh, good night. And uh, we'll see you on February 1st.